Hello, Alexander Quinn, Starseed Navigating the Light. I am very, very excited to have Nazama, the Hebrew mystic healer on today. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. Perfect. How are you doing today? I, I'm, you're, you're in um, Egypt. That's correct. Yeah, we are currently, my husband and I are in uh, Medinti in Egypt, which is about, you know, 30 minutes away from Cairo. So, yeah, I think it's like 33 degrees there, like super hot, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> do you um, do you ever nice do you ever get the chance to go to the pyramids and check out all that stuff and maybe meditate next to them? Do do you ever do any stuff like that or? Yes, and I felt connected to the Giza pyramids and Saqqara and the Queen's pyramids, but I think Saqqara I felt the most connected. In fact, I actually saw overlays um, when we were driving up in the Uber car. So. I could actually see where what statues were where and all of that from some past lives and you know it, it was still a little challenging to really get in the meditation mode and really feel you know the ley lines and the vortexes there because there's so many people but you know it was still pretty strong so mm. it's really amazing okay so the next thing i want to talk about is you have a very very special ability and it's um something you do for a living and you also work as a, an Akashic reader and past life regressionist. Could you tell us um, a bit about that? Yeah, um, this is actually something. It was a. I was born with all clairs, and so even as a child, I could just, see. Just before and we, hear... um, just before we carry on, could you just uh, for the people that don't know, just uh, clarify the, the clair abilities, or just the. Sure. Clairs? Yeah. Yes, there's actually more than four, but when I mention them, I'm talking about the main four. So we have clear audience, which is the ability to hear things that are outside of the five senses. Clairvoyance, which is the ability to see things outside of the five senses. Um, clear cognizance, which is being able to just know something outside of you know regular knowledge of the five senses. And um, clear sentience, being able to feel outside of those particular five senses. So when I say I had all four activated, basically I was born with a with an activated um, third eye chakra, which not everybody is, although it's becoming more common um, this day and age. But um, that, so I ended up actually turning my third eye off and on a lot because it was very traumatic for me and kind of overwhelming, especially being an empath as a child. And um, the retro, what I call retro cognizance, or the ability to know things that have happened in the past, the ability to access records, that has actually been fairly recent for me. And that really started, I want to say, about a year and a half, two years ago. And I actually happened upon it accidentally, just by looking into my own records, kind of naturally doing it um, and being naturally awakened. And um, that started. Um, a few years after my Kundalini awakening, I activated my, my soul star chakra, which I'll get into the chakras a little later on in the interview, because I know you wanted to talk about that. Uh, once I activated that, that is really what kind of kick-started, technically speaking, the Kundalini awakening kick-started everything, but that was really what kick-started my ability to kind of look into my own records, so to speak, commune with my own my own soul group. And the more chakras and the more etheric DNA and cosmic DNA that I activated within myself as above, so below, um, the more I was able to access. And then I accidentally happened upon the ability to do that with others. So I started drawing pictures of my past lives. Um, in fact, if you want, you can show the primordial dragon one Sure. And so as I described earlier, you know, I resemble kind of what you would think Quetzalcoatl. It's interesting. It's actually related to my Aztec ancestry, which is part of that Hebrew line. But um, I drew that when I saw that. And so I started drawing other past lives as well, past life in Mintaka, Orion, you know, past life as an avian, like all these different past lives I started drawing and I would share them in the star mm -hmm. groups. And pretty soon people start asking, well, hey, if you can access yours, could you draw mine? And I thought, I don't know, maybe. And so it just kind of naturally went from there. And I, I started to get better and better at it. And I could just look at someone's picture and just be able to tap in, you know. And um, so that's really essentially how I do it. I do it. 
I do it visually, but then I'll also get like actual clear audience, like phrases, responses, information, or clear cognizance. So I'll just know stuff um, or feel stuff or sense stuff. So that's basically how it happened. It kind of just happened serendipitously. And then I thought, hey, you know, if I'm able to help myself and heal my own ancestral line and my cosmic line and activate and remember, and I'm able to tap into other people, then I can help them do the same. And it just kind of developed organically from there. Mm. Yes, because it's interesting, because when, when I first met you, you were saying, hey, I'm getting this um, Arcturian thing coming through. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's definitely right. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then you were saying, and we were, we were talking prior to this interview, and you were saying, um, I think we were talking about, I can't remember, we might have been talking about musical zone, but you were saying, I'm oh, getting a, a lion thing coming through from Regulus. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah I'm, a, <laughs> I, I'm a typical Leo. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you, you definitely have yeah, whatever. Yeah, what's funny I, is I didn't even know you were a Leo when I said that either. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't, I went and looked afterward, you know, to see if it was on your profile. And I was like, okay, there he's a Leo, cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I don't put that stuff up on the internet. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's no way, yeah. you, there's no way you could have you could have guessed all that stuff. What I would really love yeah. to do um, is show the viewers some of your artwork. Um, and we've got five um, pictures that you sketched, uh, and I just want to go through them. I've got one, two, three, four, five, and I just want to talk a little bit about them. Um, could we start with the um, the first one, the Elemental Earth Angel? And I'll put this picture up and just give us a, a little brief description and just flow on, on anything you want to say, and then we'll move on to the next one. This was actually one of the first um, elementals that I run across doing client readings. Um, obviously I'll keep the client's names confidential while I'm describing the pictures, but this particular client was an actual elemental earth angel. So this client was both an elemental and an angel seed, which I actually talk about that, um, on my channel for anyone that's interested. I, I actually have a, a video where I talk about the different seeds, whether someone is a star seed, um, a quote unquote angel seed, quote unquote inferno seed, which I explain what that is and why I use the quotes in my video. Um, elemental seed, earth seed, because there's really this misnomer that um, everyone is a star seed, and that's just not true because this, where we're seeded is our first incarnation within this universe. So wherever our first incarnation is, that would be the quote unquote seed because that's where our soul is. So we were seeded from there to a different location. So that's really, that's where that whole terminology comes from. So with this um, young lady, she was actually a mix between elemental and angelic and that was her origin. And so that was what I drew in that picture. Okay, and just before I show the next picture, um, let's just talk a little bit about seeds just quickly, because as you say, there are different seeds. There are earth seeds, there are star seeds. Um, can you just share a little bit of light on that just before we go to the next picture? Sure. An earth seed would be somebody who began their first incarnation in this universe, like in the earth realms. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they did not begin outside of this universe. It just means that when they came, they chose to incarnate on earth first that resonated with their particular frequency the most. And that's where they wanted to be. Now, some earth seeds go back all the way to the kingdom of Mu and some are fairly new, you know, but either way, it just means that that was their first incarnation. So earth would be their home. And you can usually tell who these people are because they'll feel very comfortable here and they will feel very protective of, of the earth and they will think back fondly of, you know, some of the earlier times in history where people did live more line. Now that doesn't mean everybody, cause I know there's a lot of star seeds that have memory of, for example, Mu and Lemuria and think back fondly. But I, I mean, I, I feel like I'm not just speaking for myself here. When I say people that the earth is not their home, we don't feel too at home here. You know, we have to kind of work at that. <laughs> so, yeah. That would be like a dead giveaway. The person really feels at home. Elemental seeds are those who, when they first began um, in this universe, they chose to be an elemental. So they worked within a very specific element, earth, air, fire, or water. And so that doesn't mean that that's the only element that they stayed in throughout their incarnations. It just means that they began working with that element. So it's very similar to an angel because you're working with certain frequencies. Now an angel, um, I don't like to use the term angel because I feel like it's misappropriated, just like the term demon. But angel really 
literally means it, it's derived from the word angelo which means messenger but most of the time we think of angels are actually demigods or sons of god at least that's how they're described in the bible so an angel seed though in general is somebody who began in the angelic celestial realm so they were helping with something very specific within those frequencies and there's different types of them there's orphan there's seraphim there's cherubim there's um chariots and wheels i mean it just goes on and on and so that would be an angel seed and an elemental seed would be and an elemental seed can actually have their first incarnation in the celestial realm and still be an elemental seed because the elements exist in those realms as well you know or they could have started in in the earth realm but the difference being that they started within that particular element and assisting that element and so um an inferno seed again I started calling them inferno seeds because I felt the demon seed. When you say that, most people think automatically think of something very specific. So, sure. I can see, I can see the be... I can see the client being freaked out about that. So, what was your past life? You were a freaking demon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that probably might that probably might scare people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so these would be um, these would be uh, beings that began either in the ice, the inferno, or the abyss realm, which means they were conceived down there from from demonic like divine principles that exist in those realms now that doesn't make those divine principles evil it means that they run things down there so you know just because somebody is a prison like a prison guard doesn't mean that they're necessarily you know mistreating the prisoners so to speak but that's basically how i would explain it is that they operate on more of the shadow side of things and so their job is to look under look over those kind of more underworld areas so those that rule in the abyss are responsible for watching over those who are sent to the abyss, okay? Those who rule over the infernal realms are watching over those who incarnate in the infernal realms because they're basically serving out a sentence. It's part of the will of samsara. Same thing with the ice realms. So I kind of lump them all together with inferno seeds, but in a nutshell, it could be ice, inferno, or abyss seeds. They're basically demonic intelligences that began within those realms as their first incarnation. So it doesn't make them bad or evil, but I just kind of felt the need to distinguish her because, like I said, there's that association with the word demon where I actually talk about what a demon actually is on my channel as well. If people want to check that out. Yeah, so. I'm, and I'm going to put all the links below um, to your page sure. uh, and all the stuff you do. Uh, so it'll all be down there so, so you guys can go and check that all out. Um, are you happy to move to the next picture? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so number two, we got a we got a Regulus being. Uh, I'm going to put that up. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so Regulus is considered the heart of Leo, and so a lot of people when they think of star seeds, they don't think about the fact that someone can actually begin their first incarnation within you know the horoscope constellations or what we would associate with the horoscope. So somebody who's Regulus, you know, either had an incarnation there or they began there as their first incarnation, which I've seen clients with both. It's actually a very common incarnation. Now, I've only come across like one or two clients that have it as their first incarnation, like their their starseed origin, but it's quite common. So they will typically be lion-like. They will either be like a, a white or gold lion with wings. They would tend to have like violet or gold or orange colored eyes. Um, some of them will kind of look like a cross between a hominid and a lion, the walk on two feet. You know, they look kind of similar to the stereotypical uh, feline beings that people talk about coming from Lyra. Okay, that's very interesting. And something uh, I want to add myself is um, the Pleiadians um, sometimes refer to Earth as the living library. Like it's a kind of place where a lot of genetic um, kind of information is stored. So a lot of these sort of animals and things we see are also part um, kind of genetic um, storage for things that are actually out there uh, in the universe. Would, would that resonate with you, Earth being like a living library? Yeah, I align with that. I feel like even in our human avatars, we contain four different brains. I mean, there are any being that we see existing on here, there's some variation of that within the universe or even other universes within the multiverse for sure. Okay, cool. All right, we're going to go to picture three. So this uh, is the primordial dragon self. So this is actually... Uh, a sketch of your actual um, incarnation, if you could tell us about it. 
Yeah, I wanted to kind of show an example of a, a primordial, and I thought that one was really nice and colorful, so it would be a good choice for that. But, um, yeah, that would be my first. That was the form I took when I first emanated out of the void. So I had all the primary colors. Um, I had six wings. You can't really see it in the drawing, but I basically had feathered serpent with six wings. So that would that was my first um, form when I emanated out of the void before I entered the universe that I'm currently incarnated in, you and I both. <laughs> so. Okay. And the next one, we've got a, a blue being uh, holding a bull who is an Andromedan. If you could tell us about that one. Yes. Um, that's actually the first Andromedan star seed that I've come across so far. Um, and the thing is, is uh, we hear a lot, a lot of different um, star seeds, but to be honest, the most common that I see are Orion and Sirius and Lyra. Um, Palladians and Arcturians and Andromedans are more rare than you think. And I know that that may seem surprising to a lot of people out there, but although um, a lot of people have had Palladian incarnations or have had Andromedan or Arcturian incarnations, as far as it being a starseed origin, it's um, it's less common than people would think, now, for sure. I've heard out of all of those uh, that the souls um, that were the fewest that came were from Andromeda. That's what I actually heard. Yeah. And, and, and so far, based on what I've seen, that seems to be the case because I've only, as I said, came across one so far where that was. And, and the, the, other, the other thing to remember is for two different Andromedans, there's the, there's the Andromeda galaxy and there's the Andromeda constellation. So just to be clear, so it's more rare for someone to come from the Andromeda galaxy. Got it, got it. And, um, they are at a very high frequency. And so I think that has a lot to do with the why there's so few here. Okay, very, very cool. Um, the last one we've got here, uh, the fifth one, is a Anunnaki Syrian. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, um, that particular client was a very high vibration. And when, when she incarnated, that was her first incarnation when she came in from the void. Um, she, like me, we came in as primordials entering the, the universe, except when she entered, she chose to incarnate within Sirius, and I chose to incarnate within Orion. And so she looks like what many would say is a reptilian, but there's actually various different reptilian races. So she that's actually her her Anunnaki form in Sirius. That was her first incarnation when she came in. And she chose to incarnate within that avatar because it more closely aligned to her draconic blueprint as a primordial. Okay, very, very, very cool. And um, in terms of uh, previous lives, do you ever do, uh, do you ever tap into earthly lives or do you just specialize mostly in star um, and cosmic star family lives? I do both, but I feel like whenever I'm, because how I tap in is I actually ask the client's higher self and their spiritual team to assist me with what they want to bring out specifically. And I don't just, I could technically with my ability, if I wanted to, I could just tap into anyone, but I don't do that because I'm a respecter of sovereignty. So I don't access people's records just arbitrarily. Like I'd make sure I get permission first. Plus, you know, a lot of people's ancestors or patron gods, etc. they're not going to take too kindly to that anyway. And I've been blocked before even with people giving me permission they had to like talk to their ancestors and their spiritual sorry, teams the, to even... uh, the, the door just slammed here sorry about that carry on that's okay so um what what did you ask though because i just i got distracted from my train of thought um it's gone now it's actually gone I, I've, I've got a bit of a a, a freaky door slamming situation here i think i might have a might have some spirits on my end but um it, but it's interesting how how um and by the way i do encounter um spirit um often i have things move around the house and stuff like that um so what... now i remember sorry now i remember yeah um you were asking about earthly lives yes and um, i feel like the higher selves of people are so happy to be able to talk about their cosmic lives that the only time they'll seem to focus on their earth lives is if there is something very specific that they want um, their 
earth incarnated version of their 3d self to do to heal because really path the whole point of accessing our past lives isn't just to get caught up in ego and be like oh i was this and i was that and la di da it's so we can work and heal traumas associated with these past lives mm. because there's really this misconception that you know people who are from the stars or from the heavenly realms that there's no that there's like no duality there that there's no war there's no trauma and that i'm telling you right now that could be further from the truth that is like one of the biggest misconceptions right now in the star city community because the heavenly wars there are so many texts that talk about that it doesn't just come from nowhere i mean even if we look at the orion wars so clearly we can't say on one hand that these things have taken place but then on the other hand say that there's no duality in the higher realms is not true. So and, and in fact, duality exists going all the way back to the first emanation of formation, you know, technically a Trinitarian type expression. So yeah. Um, so yeah, that's how I, that's what I would say. Like I do get information on people's earth lives, but it'll be very specific images or very specific things. Um, or sometimes if the person themselves wants to concentrate on their earth lives, I will tune in specifically to that. But the way I have my readings tailored is the first thing I look for is the pre-universal origin. If the client has one, because not everybody does. And then I look at their first incarnation and soul group. And then I look at um, their first human incarnation and their um, karmic resolution. So that's the very basic, that's, that's the bare bones. Now with some of my more extended readings going up to my live readings that I do, cause I, the biggest packages I have are 60 minute live readings that come with a sketch. Now, when I do those, I'll tap in way more. So more celestial incarnations, um, any elemental incarnations, angelic incarnations, inferno incarnations, totems, um, I'll go into more depth in certain lives. And so it really, it just varies from client to client and it varies from reading to reading is what I would say. Okay. That's fantastic. That's amazing. And, um, have you had any, uh, just quickly going back to what you were saying, it's interesting how sometimes it's actually blocked so that you can't actually read it. Do you know who's blocking it? Is it yes. the yourself or is it something else? Yes. Um, I've had some people where their higher self is what I think it is. Most of the time will block me from seeing their pre-universal origin. And that's interesting. And so it happens for a couple different reasons, as far as I can tell, is that they want their 3D self to focus on other things. So that's usually one thing they want them to work through some other stuff. Sometimes that person can have energetic blocks. And so it's not that their higher self is preventing them. It's more that I can't see because they can't see, they can't access to that extent. Um, and another thing that can happen is a spiritual team is made up of ancestors that really haven't had a positive experience with mediums or channelers. And so they tend to kind of put up this wall. Um, I had that happen recently with a client where I almost thought that she was an NPC because when I was looking at her, all I could see was just Torian field. When you say, thought, uh, when you say an NPC, could you just expand on that? Sure. Um, yeah, there would be like a non-player characters. So we live in a holographic universal egg. So not everybody here is a soul. And that's, a, and that's kind of hard for some people to accept as well is that, you know, there is no equality in the universe. Like everything may go back to one origin point, technically speaking, but, and, and everything is consciousness, but everyone has different origin points. Everyone has, you know, different incarnations and blueprints. And so somebody who is a non uh, player character or a non player consciousness is what I would prefer to call them would be somebody who is actually part of the universal matrix itself the that high intelligent machine if you will so like you used to in the movie the matrix for example would so not be, uh, would that be the, the the guy with the glasses what's his name hello and neo <laughs> he would be like a, a program so yeah in a way they're they're like programs they're all they all have their jobs and they can incarnate and they can feel and think you know, just there's, I mean, I, we, it's not like we would treat them differently, you know, yeah. or at their left stand or anything like that. But the difference being is that they don't have that primordial spark that souls have. And so they can't exist outside of them, of the universal matrix. So they basically just circulate within that wheel. So that's how I would explain it. So they, so, that, so does that also mean they lack creator energy? Yes. Yes. 
So they'll be more limited. That's actually good. That, that's actually a good way of putting it is that somebody that has a primordial spark, it will have creative capabilities. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. So now they can, just to be clear, they will have very, they can be creative, but it'll be limited. It'll be like a programmed, um, like a job or a role. And, and they'll tend to not know how to go outside of that role. So they're very set in that particular niche. So during what um, I think most people understand as ascension, which just quickly is basically the rising of Earth's um, vibrations and things, will these, um, as you call them, non-player characters, or people that don't have create, creative energy, will they go up into higher 4D density and into fifth uh, with the the other, uh, well, everyone else is ascending, or do they stay put uh, where they are? Because there is the two Earth theory where one part of Earth uh, is overlaid on the other, and there will be people going up into higher fourth and fifth. Will and then will those people kind of stay where they are in third? Does that make sense? Well, first, I feel like I have to um, maybe clarify that I don't share a lot of the same ascension views as a lot of people in the star Starseed community. So I feel like there's already a 5D Earth, just as there's a 3D Earth, just as there's a 4D Earth, just as there all, all these Earth rings already exist. So when I talk about ascension, what I'm essentially talking about is our consciousness being raised while we're on this Earth to the point that we either translate translate while still in the physical body to another earth where we literally can transplant ourselves there that's how higher vibration gets or when we pass on we incarnate there because our vibration matches that frequency okay so that's how i would explain ascension and to answer your question non-player consciousnesses are all over on all different dimensions so in fact a lot of what people channel is actually programs that are in the heavenly realms Okay. So it's not always like uh, like soul expressions. And how often do you come across some angelic uh, people who are just purely angelic in past lives? Are they common or not so common? Not very common, no. Um, they, there's more coming down now, but they tend to actually get very tripped up in materialism because it's kind of like they don't know how to navigate it. So you'll have one or two extremes. You usually have somebody that's very compassionate and just kind of lets people walk all over them. Or you'll get the people that get caught, almost like stuck in an extreme hedonism because it's their first time experiencing it. So I've seen those two kind of extremes happen with, with angelic seeds. Okay, all right, that's fascinating. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about is you, uh, before, we, uh, before we did this interview, there were some things you were talking about that were fascinating to me that I wanted to expand on. And uh, there's an eight point uh, thing I want to talk through um, regards um, chakras. Um, are, mm -hmm. you okay to, are you okay to talk about that? Yeah. Um, could we start with the, um, the one that you brought up first, the governing principle chakras, the one to seven, and then we'll move on to the earth chakra um, system. Sure. So um, most people, when they incarnate, you know, they will have these seven chakras, but most people won't have them activated. Most people come when they incarnate and they're only activated up to like their third chakra. And the reason for that is, is the way that, that the, it's, and it doesn't really have anything to do with the density as much as it does the way that the governing bodies, the way that the paradigms and things are structured here is it's very focused on the lower nature. And so usually unless somebody is like from a higher origin you know they're from like an angelic or a starseed origin most of the time they won't be activated there now it doesn't mean they can't activate once they come here but there's a lot of work put in in fact um there's kriya yogis that spend generations and and uh lifetimes doing that and in fact when you talk to these gurus they'll say that we technically have six chakras main chakras because there's minor six main chakras on the body and then the seventh is actually outside the body the crown's actually outside the body that's how they would explain it but you know the one the first chakra would be the root so that's associated with our survival mechanism and a lot of people are over action anxiety or very concerned with materialism usually have an off balance there then you have the sacral which deals with sexuality and creativity and again the society is very focused on that and so a lot of people are off balance there one way or the other then you have the solar plexus region, which is will. 
again, another one. And this is what I mean by those are the three that usually people run off of. The third one being will. And people usually tend to either have a lack of willpower or tend to project their will onto others, depending on the situation. So when that happens, that can be an imbalancing there. So people that have those aligned will have, if, if their root chakra is balanced, they will have, um, they will feel grounded but they won't be like attached to the material world, but they'll be grounded and they'll be present in it, if that makes sense. And they won't worry about, you know, their, their ability to survive. Um, when the sacral chakra is balanced, the person is very creative. They can express their sexuality in a healthy way without it being obsessive or underactive. Um, when somebody has a balanced solar plexus, they, will have very strong sense of self and boundaries, but they won't try to, you know, overpower somebody else's sense of will or boundaries. Okay, so then you go beyond that, you have the heart chakra. This is the one that most people have a really hard time with, and it's also considered the middle aspect of self. So the lower self would be those lower chakras, the middle self, you know, this is where we get a lot of our intuition from. Some of us get the intuition from the solar plexus and sacral too. It just depends. I mean, we have all these different um, vortexes and governing intelligences within us. So it just depends. But the heart center is where we feel compassion. This is where we feel connected to others. So somebody who has an active and balanced heart chakra will be able to be compassionate and forgiving. People who have an overactive heart chakra tend to be very emotional without any kind of balance. Uh, people have underactive will tend to be more like sociopathic, you know, or narcissistic is how I would explain it. Then you have the throat chakra. So if someone has an active throat chakra, they're good at listening and speaking. They have a very clear sounding voice and they will be good at um, understanding and discerning truth and speaking truth and, and being able to discern when truth is being spoken. Um, Somebody who has an overactive chakra might interrupt a lot. Somebody who has an underactive chakra may have a hard time speaking up for themselves. Then you have the third eye chakra. Now, when we start getting to the third eye and crown and higher, this is where most people are underactive or closed. Some people are totally closed. Um, the third eye is our ability to access our different clairs that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's our ability to see into the spiritual realm. Now, most of us, unless we're like, walking around as ascended masters most of us don't have it turned on like 24 7 or we would be overwhelmed by all the input but we can tune into it it's like a lens like focusing or unfocusing i know for myself i can choose when i want to tap in or not um unless i'm getting a lot of input and it's too much for me to filter through but somebody that has that active they'll get inner wisdom, inner knowing. They'll have all their their clairs activated with their sixth sense. So that's the third eye chakra. Um, somebody who has a closed third eye chakra will have a hard time understanding things. They won't really get dreams. Um, they will have a hard time with imagination or meditation. Now the crown chakra, again, um, this is also commonly closed. Uh, but a crown chakra that's open, you will have access to the seven angels or the seven vortexes. Um, you will have access, in many cases, to your own sense of uh, paternal, maternal, child nature. From what I found, it's the I am frequency. When you have the crown activated, the I am that I am. So it's when you start to understand that you are consciousness and you are divine at that level, when you activate this particular chakra, um, this is when you can start activating the higher chakras. So it'll little, literally open up a portal to the higher chakras as well. And you can start getting information that way. So in other words, um, an individual who does not have their crown or their third eye active is not going to be able to access information from the higher chakras. So that's how I would explain the one through seven okay. chakras. Um, tell me about the Earth Star Chakra. The Earth Star Chakra is located below our feet, and this chakra is what houses the Earth Akashic records. So you, usually when we're accessing it, it doesn't mean that we access it and we can literally see everything that's ever happened because everybody within their own DNA is gonna have their own individual memories dealing with the earth records. So it's basically like a narrative 
of our own memories. So when we access the Earth Star Chakra, we begin to access our own past lives on Earth, our own um, 3D ancestral connections, and any particular Earth records that we contain within us and within our DNA expression at that level. Okay, tell me about the Soul Star Chakra. When you activate the Soul Star Chakra, that's when you really meet your higher self. So what a lot of people think is their higher self, they're usually dealing with their middle self. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, the higher self is actually located in the Soul Star Chakra. And also that's where you're, you'll have access to your soul group origin or your soul group resonance is you know, in through that chakra. So you will get certain records. You may find out what your first uh, universal incarnation was based on accessing your soul star. But that's when you really start communicating with like your, like what star seeds would call their soul fam, uh, their, their star family. What most people would call their higher self is located in the soul star chakra. Okay, and the galactic chakra? The galactic chakra, when, when we access that, we start to get access to our galactic records. So any incarnations that exceed past our soul group origin within the galaxy itself. Okay. The universal chakra. So just going up a notch, same thing. We will get access to our records within the universal A construct. So... Again, it doesn't necessarily mean that like I, I go in and I, I like check out a library book and all of a sudden I have like every second of every lifetime I've ever had in the universe. It's just that we can tap in and we can access those universal, you know, incarnations that we've had throughout the entire universal egg structure. Okay. Um, tell me a bit about, uh, you were talking about the, the God self and the Godhead. Yes. Um, Godhead chakra, not everybody has that one. Um, that one... Anyone that has a pre-universal origin outside the universe will have that. Um, basically, that's where our connection to the daemon takes place there. But what the daemon is, is actually our authentic self. And it's the culmination of all of our dimensions of self kind of squished together at one point or one zero point frequency. Zero point frequency isn't the same thing, but it's the only way I can use to kind of explain it. So your Godhead is basically your divine self or yourself as a God. When you when you uh, activate that chakra, you really get a sense of your own divinity and your own unique um, divine blueprint at that level is how I would explain it. It's kind of hard to explain like in quote unquote human terms using language, but that's <laughs> Okay. I think you did a very good job. What about, um, there's something you brought up that I was fascinated by, um, the cosmic uh, wound or the cosmic, is that the cosmic wound? Is that right? How do you say that? Yeah, yeah the cosmic wound would be our entrance into the cosmic womb or the primordial womb. Um, the cosmic wound is basically the exit point out of the universal egg. There's actually two of them. There's one above at the very top of the egg and there's one below. There's a vortex that goes to the center of the universe and that's where the galactic center is. So... If you look down the top of an egg, like if you were to drill a hole through an empty egg shell and you look through the hole, that's what that it goes through the center of everything. That's why they, they spin like that. It goes through the earth rings. It goes through the hellish realms all the way down. And so that is our way out of the universe. So when we, have, when we access the cosmic wound, like in our chakras, for those of us that have pre-universal origin, we can then start looking at existences outside of the universe. So that's how I would explain it. Okay. And uh, lastly, um, you explained to me that if we have um, all of this intact, we are getting close or we are becoming uh, an ascended master. And if so, uh, what kind of dimensionality does that look like? Um, I Some say uh, Jesus was a, a sick dimensional um, person. Of course, dimensions are multidimensional, but um, mm -hmm. what do you think about all of that? I think there is somebody that has... Um, like the main chakras activated, they start to go into ascended master point. They're, they join that journey, so to speak. They start walking that path. But really, it's the activation of all of those higher and lower chakras, minor and major. So an ascended master would have 144 chakras all activated and balanced. They're not going to be somebody that's caught up in um, materialism. They're going to be somebody that is very balanced. It can look at things from a balanced perspective and they basically have broken their wheels, so to speak. So 
an ascended master is somebody that can leave and enter the universe at will. Like literally they can leave and go wherever they want because they've broken their wheel. So they're not bound by the laws of samsara at that level, but they're balanced within themselves to a point where they're still going to honor and live in a harmonious way within, they're going to honor those universal laws and structures within the will of samsara. So our best bet of reaching the point of an ascended master level is to learn how to balance and have mastery over ourselves and all the shocker points. And what a lot of people tend to do in the typical, like, quote unquote, new age or star seed um, communities is they tend to ignore the lower 72 or the quiploptic chakra points. And because they do that, what they're doing is they're, it's really a disadvantage to themselves because they're not learning to master themselves or actually avoiding their darker nature. And if you're avoiding your darker nature and you're avoiding your own personal shadow, you're not going to activate your daemon and you're not going to reach ascended master status because you have to learn to master yourself before you can be an ascended master. If you can't master yourself and have temperance in 3D, how are you going to do that in the higher dimensions? How are you going to be able to control your appetites and your impulses in the higher dimensions? And is so, that, is that why is, a lot of us came down to uh, a three D Earth and the lower dimensions so that we could start uh, beginning uh, the mastery um, process? Yeah, I mean it's a mixed bag because I mean some like everyone's here for a different reason. You know, it's not a one size fits all. Some people are down here doing like community service. Basically they're working through things. They're like healing their karma. Other people are down here to help. Um, other people are down here to experience, you know, especially like the, the newer souls, you know, or those who this is their first incarnation on earth. They're here to experience others um, are here, you know, to learn. It's like school for them. Some of us have been trapped here for a long time, like literally, like since of all of Atlantis, others have only come recently. Some of us can come and go. So it really is indicative to each um, soul expression is what I would say. Could you um, expand a little bit on um, how some souls got trapped here? Because I have heard that um, some people putting up on Facebook in these Starseed forums and they've got these um, pictures that are like, Earth is a prison. Earth is a soul matrix prison. You are stuck here. Like all this stuff. Yeah. Um, you were saying some, some come and go and some are stuck here. Could you, could you expand on why some are stuck here? Uh, it's a lot of different reasons. Uh, basically, it has to do with their their trusting the... Okay, um, how I would explain it is that the reincarnation cycle at this dimension is run by Archons. And the Archons are essentially prison guards. Now... Whether or not people see them as good or evil really has more to do with their own perception, their own dealings with them. Because basically what they do is they uphold the laws of the universe, the universal laws of seven. So people that get stuck down here and can't reincarnate past are people that continually violate those laws. And they also buy into signing new contracts over and over again to keep coming here. So people who um, don't buy into that or they reach a certain frequency, when they pass, they just go right to where their origin point was because their frequency is that high. So they kind of bypass that whole system. Now, it doesn't mean that the reincarnation system isn't intact in the higher dimensions. Reincarnation systems are at the whole universal egg, but at this density specifically, it's very difficult to get past if your frequency isn't at a certain level and if you have um, a lot of personal stuff that you have avoided that you're not working through so that's how i would explain it but the reason that a lot of people got trapped here is because they forgot who they were because the first thing to go was the memories so when you don't have memory of who you were it's easy to kind of think that this is all you are so you keep coming back here because you think this is your home and you don't have any real recollection beyond that so that's how i hope i answer your question did i answer your your yeah, question good yeah. enough yeah yeah that'll do that'll do and if there are any questions um that uh the viewers are, are looking at um and they they can always type in the comments below um and then i can go looking for answers and i can get them from you and we can try and get them out there somewhere or another so don't forget about the comments um what i would love to do to to wrap this up is i want to uh talk a little bit about how people can find you 
um, how they can book uh, a reading. And uh, obviously all the links are gonna be down here. Um, and then once you've spoken a bit about that, what I wanna do just to finish off is talk about some current energies, where we're at at the moment, some things happening, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, um, basically people can find me on my YouTube channel. Um, and I, as you said, you're gonna put that link in the bottom in the drop down menu. So youtube.com slash the Hebrew Mis uh, sorry, Nizama the Hebrew Mystic Healer, and each word has a capital letter. If you wanna book with me, the best way to do that is to go on Facebook to my healing page. It's facebook.com slash the Hebrew Mystic Healer, all lowercase, all one word. I also just got my Patreon up and running, and so if anyone's interested, um, whereas my healing page, I do actual sessions. So healing sessions, past life sessions, spirit removal sessions. With the Patreon, I'm actually teaching people how to do things themselves. So how to do their own past life regression work, how to do their own shadow work, how you know to shield and cloak um, other types of, of spiritual practices, I have different tiers um, depending on what the person is interested in doing. Um, the cheapest one is $4.44 a month. The entire package is uh, $33.33 a month. That's called the Advanced Mystic tier, and that's going to have everything. And so um, if people, you know, I, I really recommend Patreon for those who are really serious about really digging in and doing a lot of hands-on spiritual work, accessing the records, dealing with their shadow um, learning actual um, mystic and in, in, um, mages type practices, um, that's that's uh, where you'd want to go. I also have some groups on Facebook, and I'm going to be creating more for different star seeds. I'm going to be creating um, some lesser known star seed groups for people to join. And um, right now, I have a star seed shadow hunter group for people, and this is free. This group is free, but I do basic shadow work units there. We share some information, we talk. It's a focus group where people get to talk about their own personal experiences and get a little bit of help and feedback on their shadow work journey. So I have that group. I also have the Nunakai Starseeds group, and I have a group um, called uh, the Draconic Path of Primordial Flame, where we deal more with like chaos magic, void magic, um, the Sephiroth and the Quibloth. And so there's different groups in different places for different people that they can learn and grow. <laughs> that, that's cool. Just quickly, what is chaos magic? Well, my interpretation of chaos magic would be something totally different than um, what a lot of other people would say. Because I'm a mystic and I'm also Hebrew, I still do things and and filter things through my my cut my customs and culture and based on my cosmic ancestry as well. So for me, because I'm an actual void being. For me, void and chaos magic is really being able to create from your own primordial flame and not needing to do anything on the external. So somebody that has, anyone that has a soul, even if you're created as a soul star, okay, anyone that has a soul will have a primordial flame within them, a spark. So in that group, and this is not, I'm just going to put it out there. This is not for people that don't have one. They won't find any benefit to this group. But if you have one, if you have a soul, if you have a divine spark, then I will help teach you to grow and develop that so that you reach a point where you no longer need to rely on external um, tools. And you can just manifest like in high alchemy within yourself for transmutation and, and personal growth within yourself and also lower alchemy or external manifestation as well. And so that's how I would explain it. It's a way of tapping into your inner void, tapping into your primordial flame and growing that primordial flame or that black flame to where you can manifest your reality. And um, it's really about developing your own primordial godhead. So that's how I would explain it. Okay, that's very, very cool. Very, very nice. To finish up, uh, what I would like to do is just talk a little bit about um, some things that are going on at the moment, some energies. Um, I'll just kick it off and then you're free to speak about anything you want to. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people at the moment going through a lot of very heavy um, uh, ascension symptoms. Um, there's some big rises in energy at the moment. Uh, we've got a lot of planets in retrograde at the moment. The Earth is through this um, ascension symptom uh, ascension process i do the the quotes thing because everyone's got a different kind of way of talking about it right. um and right now there are some major shifts happening um 
and there's a lot of people suddenly coming what I call online so i.e. souls kind of fig like having an awakening like probably now more now than ever on 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 the earth and there's a lot of noise and a lot of groups coming up um, on Facebook and and it's kind of really really happening um, do you have any advice for um, people who are awakening or stuff happening or energies and where it's all gonna go and just anything that's on your mind at the moment two things one is don't get caught up in the emotional meme programs and what I mean by that is there's a lot of um, government agents out there that are actually creating and circulating because memes are really a way to program your unconscious and just like uh, news reports and stuff are movies so on and so forth and for people that are not fully conscious or they're just beginning their journey it can really detract and get us caught up in these kind of emotional polarities going back and forth so um, I would say that go within do your own empty meditation to find answers um, don't be pulled this way or that don't get overwhelmed with this person's opinion this person's narrative and this person channeled this master and this person channeled that just focus on developing your own connection to your own higher self develop your connection to your own ancestry as above so below as within so without and I also would like to encourage people for those who are able to try to work on getting off grid I feel like that's really important right now I've been feeling that for a while I've had that message kind of sitting with me for about like you know five or six years now going on seven the importance of off-grid living is very important for to transition to the next age because the problem is is that um, for people that are keeping their frequency low and they're very attached to more materialistic things um, the certain comforts that these world systems provide us are going to have a very hard time adjusting when that world system falls and we start entering the next age and so I would really encourage people to learn skills like learn how to live off grid learn how to live more in tune to nature um, and try to distance yourself more from basically the hustle and bustle of everything and the high you know range of emotions that kind of goes on there so that would be really what I would say because the people that are going to make it to the next age are going to be those that know how to live in harmony with earthly mother and heavenly father like they're in tune with the natural cycle of times they're in tune with the way the earth operates and those who are not and those that are intentionally trying to destroy it are not going to make it okay fantastic because there's a lot of theories these days about why the pyramids are there i mean and and i've heard that um they're aligned to sirius as well i mean have you got a, a take on that yeah i agree they're aligned to sirius they're aligned to orion and even to draco to an extent and but especially orion's belt um definitely and my personal theory on that is that they used to be stargates because the pyramids are actually older. A lot of people think the Egyptians built them or they think, you know, EDs or what I call extra dimensionals built them, but it was actually the Lemurians. So oh, really? the original, yeah. So the original um, Egyptian pyramids are actually stargates and they go back a very long time. Because I, um, another theory that I've heard is that when the uh, the great flood that happened thirteen thousand years ago, um, they went underground, and that's when some of them became like the inner earth people or the Agathan people. But then they came back out, and some of them came back out in Egypt. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, based on like my own Akashic records and some of the experiences I've had, some of the meditations, there is definitely some layers to Earth. It's not. Um, completely hollow like I don't I don't subscribe to the hollow earth theory and I don't subscribe to the theory of earth being a sphere I actually um, I know because you've uh, seen some of my videos I'm always referencing the universal egg in the beginning of my videos like that's the model I follow the holographic universal egg model which actually puts um, earth as rings with with various Torian fields over each ring and for example that's what's being referenced in Lord of the Rings for example the the different rings of earth and then you have the heavenly dimensions above and you have the hellish dimensions below but and then the abyss at the very bottom of the egg but before you get to those dimensions you actually have these layers of earth where yes there have been underground civilizations and not just, you know, quote unquote human. There have been non human civilizations as well. Some Naga like beings have lived under there. 
um, you know, some different types of aquatic beans and, and definitely a mixed bag there. Um, a lot of different types of uh, beings and races have existed on Earth for sure. And I, I, I've heard in some um, places that we still have a, a reptilian presence. There are still some reptilian, uh, what, bases or clusters um, living in inner, inner Earth. Have you have you um, come across that? I've heard of it. Um, to be honest, I haven't experienced it personally, but I do know people who have um, that are psychonauts and astral travelers. Based on some people I've talked to, um, that has been the case. They have actually um, remote viewed. Some of them have had you know certain memories or direct experiences. I myself have not, but um, I definitely think that it, it's highly likely, especially given the nature of how the government operates and the type of technology they have. So. And can we um, talk a little bit about the way you dress and also the significance of the of the eye and what that means? Sure. Um, the way I dress basically goes back to my 3D heritage. And um, I believe in covering my locks. I actually have dreadlocks, like very long dreadlocks. Cool. Um, that are um, still in their maturing phase. I've had them going on two years. And they're, um, they're basically left to just lock on their own. Um, and they really do help kind of boost my signal, so to speak. Oh, yeah? So I... <laughs> you know, that, yeah. that's not the first time I heard that, because if, if you go back to uh, World War Two, Hitler was using um, Al Alderber Alderberan beings called the Vril, and they had very long hair, so they said that they couldn't right. cut it. There's, is there a similar kind of thing? Is there something in that? Yes, absolutely. Our hair is really an extension of our nervous system, and it picks up on subtle energies. In fact, there is um, some uh, government agencies that are rumored to have actually used Native American trackers, um, which if, I don't know if you know this or not, but I actually have um, Native American heritage. I'm a mixed bag, but mostly like Native heritage. And um, they actually would use them to track, and their long hair would help them sense things coming. It was it was a sixth sense ability that they had because of their hair. Yeah. And what they noticed is when they would shave the heads of these trackers, they would lose much of their capability. And I have found in the past because I've you know I've had my hair all different lengths and colors and so on and so forth, and I've definitely noticed the difference. It, it is like a signal booster. So I cover my head. Um, it's it's part of the culture, but mostly it has to do with protecting myself energetically. And so I will normally cover my head when I'm doing any kind of um, spiritual practice and uncover it with other certain types of spiritual practice that's more insulated um, where I don't have to worry about a lot of interference but I especially cover my head when I'm out and about in public so it just kind of gives me an extra layer of protection um, when I'm you know in public and I'm around a lot of energies because there's a lot of you know astral debris so to yeah. speak out there and so that's basically the main reason and the same thing goes with the eye the eye is a protective amulet for me um, I use it to protect against the evil eye primarily but also anyone you know attempting to read my energy um, anyone with any kind of uh, negative intent, it's it's really, again, just like an extra measure of protection. So for me, it's a combination of uh, cultural customs of embracing my ancestors' culture and also, um, you know, just an extra layer of uh, spiritual protection. And could you expand a little bit on, on uh, your sort of um, cosmic heritage and, and, and where you come from yourself and, and a little bit on uh, your earthly heritage as well? Sure. Um, my cosmic heritage actually is pre-universal. It goes back to the primordial void. So I'm actually a primordial. So I was one of the first uh, generations to emanate out of the void. Uh, when I did, my form was as a primordial dragon. So I resembled Quetzalcoatl. I had a feathered, I was a feathered serpent, um, rainbow colored with um, six wings like a seraphim. And that's how I appeared when I came out of the void. And when I came out of the void, I, myself, and my collective, we started creating soul stars and helping to form universes. And um, from what I've seen doing uh, soul memory, I actually wrapped around the current universe that we're in, and that's how I got inside. I wrapped around and it's kind of disappeared inside. In fact, it's it's very similar to the Greek depiction of the Orifim. I don't know if you've ever seen that. I don't know. That, that. Yeah, it's, it's basically the... All of the ancients um, knew that the universe was egg-shaped. It was an egg-shaped holographic universe. And so 
there's actually a depiction called the orifin where a snake, it's a primordial symbol where the snake is wrapped around the egg. And that is actually how I got in here. And so once I got in here, as I was dropping down in density and dimensions um, from 12 down, my soul group settled within the constellation of Rigel Orion. And so that was my first, you know, emanation, um, if have you, well, you know. Um, so I've had, a, I've had angelic incarnations of seraphim. I've had reptilian incarnations. I've had um, avian incarnations. I've had uh, feline incarnations, hominid incarnations. But everything followed a migratory pattern, basically, on my way down, so to speak. As far as my 3D physical heritage, I'm a mixed bag of uh, Moorish, uh, Portuguese, Basque, um, Aztec, Potawatomi, uh, Lakota, um, and I'm forgetting one other Native American tribe off the top of my head. But the main, those were the main two. Mm. Um, and also um, Irish and Scottish, um, but the, uh, the original Irish and Scottish, not like the later um, incursions. So, and uh, Scythian Viking as well. And again, not the, the later so-called Caucasian Norse Vikings, but like the original Scythian Vikings. So that's pretty much my heritage. And um, I align with the, with the tribe of Dan, the Hebrew Israelite tribe of Dan. So that's actually my, my patrilineal heritage. And um, it's interesting because the totem is a serpent. And my totem literally is a serpent, um, one of my four totems. So which totems are really um, a reflection and embodiment of that DNA resonance, the that particular alignment. So, Because you also have some Anunnaki or Anunnaki, as you call it, um, yes. links as well. Is that part of the serpent thing? It is. Um, but, you know, anyone... Basically, the, the serpent was Inky's symbol, and yeah. I am from Inky's line. And um, I should have just said specifically Anunnaki, Rigelian, Orion. Um, Inky was actually rumored to be pure um, Rigelian, Orion once, you know, once like the Anunnaki entered the universe from the primordial void. So I am from that line. I haven't been told exactly who I am yet. Um, I was actually told by my higher self that I'm not ready to hear that. So Ooh, I don't know trippy. exactly who I am. <laughs> but, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> but um, yeah, I know I'm from that. I know I'm from that line. Yeah. And I think I was actually male. I don't think I was female. Okay. Um, although I've had um, male and female incarnations, I think for that specific one that deals more with like the the type of um, Anunnaki um, royal lineage people think of that that one I think I was male, um, and in general the Anunnaki who are because I would be considered a quote unquote Anunnaki starseed from Orion and primarily when our kin came in here when they you know, crossed over, which is what Nibiru means, and also what Hebrew means. They both mean cross over. They're both a Shemitic language. And you can even hear how they sound very similar. So when we crossed over, we mostly settled primarily within Sirius, Orion, and Draco, to a little, a slight extent Lyra, but mostly those areas. So, and, and it's not an accident that that's also, you know, those constellations are where the pyramids are aligned to as well for stargates. So the Anunnaki were the first to really come down here and interact like at this level. And we also created the egg as well. Now there were other star races. Um, there were other star beings that also had a hand in creating races. Um, it gets real kind of convoluted with the different root races and the different lineage, but suffice to say like everybody has their own unique cosmic blueprint and you know your physical 3d heritage will be compatible with your cosmic heritage to some degree so we do tend to incarnate through our own ancestry as above so below and that's why the ancients didn't believe in mixing because they believed that if you had a pure line it was easier for your ancestors to continually incarnate through and we could hold on to ancestral memory sure. we didn't start losing our memory until the fall of Atlantis. Before then, we would incarnate, we would have all our memories intact. And then that's when the veil came down. Mm hmm Fascinating, fascinating. A, a, a lot of um, questions. I've asked you this question before myself, before this interview, but a lot of um, 
uh, I get a lot of questions, a lot of emails saying, uh, what do the Anunnaki actually look like? Could you um, expand on that? Because just before you do, um, there's a lot of um, images of sort of Arcturians and Palladians and Syrians and Lyrans and and uh, beings from Regulus um, and the Lion and say we've got Zetas and we've got ones from Zeta A and Zeta B and we've got like all this stuff. But the mystery seems to be lurking with uh, the Anunnaki a little bit. Could you tell us a little bit what, what uh, why that is and what form they take? I think that's because as primordial beings are naturally shapeshifters, I should say we, I'll just use they and we interchangeably, are naturally shapeshifters. So, um, you know, you can even see that depicted in um, the uh, the Exodus, uh, not Exodus, excuse me, the Egyptian gods and kings, maybe I think it was called, or, um, I forget what it was called, but they, they did, they were showing the Egyptian gods from many of them were like uh from the council of nine and they were very large they were taller they were considered um giants they're usually like between um 10 to 12 feet tall like it, when they take on human form they were called the nephilim right um there's some debate about that yes there there is a nephilim but the nephilim were considered it, it gets a little convoluted again because the Nephilim were also considered to be from a separate lineage or considered to be from the Canaanite lineage, and they were more hybridized or constructed. Um, there were also, what makes it confusing too, is there were also giant races that came before the human races that were, the Lemurian races, for example, were not the size we are now, but yet we descended from them. We, I'm talking about as in humans. So it's not as cut and dry as we've been led to believe. So you can't really just lump everybody in as all giants or Nephilim or all Anunnaki look this way or that way, because it also has to do with the avatars that they took before they came down here. So, you know, most most of us, when we crossed over from the void into the universe, we chose avatars that were very compatible. So we would choose avatars that were either avian or reptilian looking, but we could shapeshift as well. So in a nutshell, like most of the time when, you know, the Anunnaki present themselves, they look like very large melanated humans and they can also shape shift like, like into cut, serpentine. Cut, cut, like beings of color. Yeah. Yes. Primarily. Now I'm not saying all because for example, um, if you look at the people that are running the earth at this time, from the line of, of Edom, which is which is uh, just like just like uh, Israel or Jacob, they're one of the Nibiru races. They're brothers going way back. They tend to look more Caucasian looking, right? And they're technically a hybridized Anunnaki bloodline. So it's not always across the board, but primarily in starting out, yes. And it's so funny because I heard this rumor. I don't know if this is uh, true or not. But that um, Zachariah Sitchin, um, I forget, who's the guy that, uh, what, uh, what is the guy's name that did uh, Prometheus? I forget his name. Oh, I can't remember. I could probably look it up. Indian movie, Ridley Scott. Yes, Ridley Scott. He, um, <laughs> anytime he does the movies, whenever the people are supposed to be melanated, he always casts like Caucasian people. <laughs> and he actually wanted to do a movie based on um based on the Anunnaki and Ooh. he was talking to Zachary Sitchin about it and Zachary Sitchin actually denied him the Ooh. right to do that because he wanted to make them white so that's why he have has them as white and Prometheus that was like his version or his spin of that story without him taking the rights of that of the original story so Zachary Sitchin actually did say no you know fascinating so I thought yeah that was a rumor I heard I'm not saying that that is for sure the case but yeah I mean, if you look at all the 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 first races were all melanated, you know, and also blue. There are blue races as well, and not all of the quote unquote gods were Anunnaki, you know. But the ones that dealt with the Hebrews, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, um, the Greeks, those were basically all retellings of the original, like Atlantean Anunnaki presence. Um, that's why you see the same types of archetypes being kind of recast over and over again. Um, like for example, Zeus being in Lil, you know, you know, um, uh, Poseidon being Inky, for example, you know, just to give like one, one example there. So 
a lot of these are just retellings of older stories that happened. And the other interesting thing that's been um, happening recently is um, this uh, it sounds like some conspiracy theory shit, yo. But um, <laughs> but I, uh, I I've been seeing a lot of this um, stuff whereby uh, the Illuminati Sorry. or uh, the government have been basically going to dig sites. Uh, where there's been archaeology because there's been a lot of huge skeletons which have been unearthed um, and governments are keeping a majorly tight freaking wrap on trying to basically not let people know that there are massive skeletons out there. Okay. Can, can, do, do you want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, the Smithsonian has actually been covering that up for a long time. In fact, if you look into old newspaper clippings, especially during the 1800s, you can clearly see that they were uncovering very large skulls that were i mean and i'm not just talking about 10 or, or 12 feet tall i'm talking about the skull would be like the size of a car they wow. were they were yes that big so i mean if i always tell people and, and my clients and just people in general that you know interviews with or discussions with that you know, there's really more truth in mythology because it's kept intact through storytelling, you know, passed on in oral traditions, whereas history, or as it called his story, is really written by the winners. And so history is really used, you know, to spread lies, whereas mythology is actually used to protect the truth. So that's basically what I tell people that, you know, when you hear these stories of, you know, giants and dragons and wizards and, you know, even Star Wars being about like the Orion Wars and all of that, all of that really just shows that, you know, these events happened. You know, they may be obscured through, you know, um, and, and slightly different based on the oral tradition, but people don't just come up with this out of nowhere. Everything is based on some semblance of truth. Yeah, very, very cool, yeah. There are also tales of um, my, my tribes, my ancestors actually battling giants in, in the United States, hmm. so. Very nice, yeah, yeah. Because I think these uh, these skeletons are getting dug up um, pretty much everywhere. Am I right, or is it in the specific parts? I know certainly in the neck of the woods where you are, a lot of certain um, the interesting things are certainly coming up in the old Sumerian, Mesopotamian kind of areas. Because that was, um, as Barbara Marciniak puts it, who um, channels all the Palladian stuff. She talks about that as like being a Anunnaki uh, spaceport. That that neck of the woods. That's kind of where they like to go up and come about, come about what being an Anunnaki spaceport sorry I didn't catch that the uh, Mesopotamia Sumeria kind of part of the world around oh. there well that's their focus um, that's really that's what they consider to be like the boundaries of their land where they had set up in their main empire and they actually that's why they they gave it over to their descendants the Hebrew my my, my ancestors because really they, they were a patriarchal society and they believed in having a patrilineal descent and not mixing. And they set the Hebrews up to set the standard for, for the earth. And so, yeah, that was basically their, their empire area, the extent of their empire. Although the Hebrew empire did extend very far. And that's another thing that's always kind of, um, you know, purposely kind of uh, blurred in history is that how vast it was. I mean, we don't really hear much. All we hear about the Hebrews is over and over kind of the tale of Exodus, but no one really talks about how vast the empire was it, that Solomon, especially that reached all over. I mean, it, it was way bigger, you know, than the Roman empire. So a lot of that just kind of gets swept under the carpet. And then the other thing being that they're always painted over as being white when we know that the earliest people, especially the people in that region, which is Africa, were not white. <laughs> so mm. there's a lot of iconoclasm that happens with that. Yeah. Now, as far as like the giants are concerned, I mean, a lot of them were just the earlier root races. And so, you know, a another, going back to the Lord of the Rings, I know I already brought that up once, but from the golden age to the copper age, we were really dealing with a mix of different beings, not just from different earth rings, but also left over from previous races that had not died out. So that was where a lot of these battles were happening. And during the golden age on earth, all of the portals that link one earth ring to the other were opened. So we had, you know, not only do we have access to other beings and other earth rings and star portal portals, but we also could access other dimensions as well and other, you know, so 
everything was less dense before the fall of Atlantis, yeah. you know, particularly around the kingdom of Mu time, which was the golden age. And that was when there was just one large society. Um, technology was light based. Uh, we could communicate with other beings, with nature. Um, the hardest technology that was really used was crystalline. And really that didn't start until Lemuria. So, you know, a much more advanced point in history. Mm. And Mu was obviously a more feline energy, whereas Atlantis was more uh, masculine. But what is interesting about Atlantis is um, there were potentially a few Atlantises and people get caught up in which one they're from um, because there were a few civilizations. Um, is that right? Yes and no. I mean, there was one there was one main continent of Atlantis, but the actual Atlantean society isn't like they just stayed on that one continent. So they were spread out in other regions. But what people kind of, what, what the whole theory of Pangea is really talking about, even though it's not really accurate, but what it really is showing is that there have been changes in continents, in the ocean rising and falling. And so the map that we currently have today is not what it looked like back then. And during the time of Mu, it was closer to Pangea where everything was kind of one big continent, so to speak. And then, you know, Lemuria and Atlantis ended up separating out of Mu. So that's basically how that happened. And yes, Atlantis did tend to be more, um, more uh, masculine and Lemuria did, did tend to be more feminine if, if we want to attribute them to polarities and label them in that way um, Atlantis was very much about hard tech and that's really when the high level hard tech way more advanced than what we have right now even was going on um, whereas Lemuria was more that was more sorcery based you know based on um, natural high level sorcery um, crystal energy um, things of that. Now there was, you know, quote unquote, good or bad or quote unquote, negative or positive things going on in, you know, in each civilization. But that's how I would kind of label it if, you, if we want to attribute it to a certain polarity. Okay, cool. Cool. That's very good. I would like to say what a great honor and a pleasure has been to talk to you today. Um, I thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I hope we have given um, the viewers uh, everything you want to know. If they don't have enough, as I say, go to the comments. Um, and either one of us will try and expand on, on some of that. And uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've really, I've really loved doing this with you. It's been such a joy. Uh, is there anything you want to finish up on? No, I mean, thank you for having me, Alexander. I really appreciate it. And um, no, not at all. Um, just, uh, guys, if you're interested, you know, definitely subscribe to my channel. You can uh, follow my videos there. Um, check me out on Facebook, as I said before, the Hebrew Mystic Killer page. Uh, you know, join up on Patreon. You know, plenty of Facebook groups, too, where we can connect at. So, uh, yeah, and it's all going to be in the drop down menu so everyone can uh, can get a hold of me there. And thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. It's a pleasure. Okay, let's wrap it up. And thank you very much. And goodbye.